This is No Sex Please. I'm religious. In many parts of the world, people are dying and being killed because of who they are and who they love. If you want to support this podcast, please visit nosexplease.com.au and follow the donation links there. Well, I have Dr. Karen Pack with me today, and uh, this is such a privilege, Karen, so thank you for making the time. No, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, David. Now, we've been planning this for a long time, <laughs> yeah. and I think I can take the blame for <laughs> making it take so long. Um, I don't know. I Karen, had been going on for a while there. <laughs> well, you're you're a busy you're a busy lady, aren't you? You know, you've got lots of stuff on your plate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, look, I'm really interested to know, um, firstly, <clears throat> about your your um, doctorate, mm-hmm. because that was a really interesting subject. Yep. And uh, for those who who may or may not have any Christian faith left, it might have been all worn out. Um, like mine seems to be, um, uh, you know, you, you've, you've done some incredible research. Feel free to just talk about it fairly, you know, briefly, but yeah. I, there's a lot to unpack. So yeah, over to you. Is. Unpacked is a nickname for my ministry, actually. Um, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so just for a little bit of context, I'm uh, a former pastor and missionary in Pentecostal and evangelical churches. And when I first started doing my doctorate, um, I was a, an unmarried, straight woman, uh, pastoring missions in churches and things like that, um, and was looking into the experience of unmarried women, single women in churches and, and pastoral care. Yeah. And in the midst of doing that, um, uh, basically was like, you know what, all these people are having conversations past each other. I want to look at how we got to where we are. And history is kind of um, one of my first loves. And so I ended up going back to history. And so what I ended up investigating was unmarried women in churches in Australia, mainline churches in Australia, who were engaged in social justice activism motivated by their faith um, that had a profound impact on Australian society. And I'm looking at late 19th century up to about the mid 20th century. Um, So a profound impact on society, doing all this justice work motivated by their faith, but nowhere in our religious histories. And so I was asking the question, why? Why do these women not make it into our story? And what difference would it make if they did? Okay. I mean, already what you've said is one tragic. It's tragic that (laughs) these wonderful heroes um, weren't acknowledged. I mean, it's crazy. Do you have any uh, particular example that really uh, you, you cherish? Yeah, there's, there's two that are oh, probably close several. to my heart. There's one okay. is a woman called um, Frances Levy, who okay. was the daughter of uh, the first Jewish free settler to Australia, actually. Her dad founded the Theatre Royal in Sydney. Uh, he was a pretty wow. notorious guy. Um, but wow. at the time that she was born in 1831 in Sydney, if you weren't baptised as an Anglican, then you were considered illegitimate. So oh. all the kids were baptised Anglican and brought up Anglican. And for most of them, it didn't particularly stick. But for for Frances Levy, it stuck. She was an ardent Anglican. And later in life, she got involved with uh, the suffrage movement and a whole bunch of different causes. But her main cause was the animal protection movement in Sydney. Yeah. And so she was wow. passionate about humanitarian action towards animals. So she's responsible yeah. for a lot of our laws about um uh, humane care of animals at the time, humane care of horses, making sure that they weren't worked to death, um, seeing things like um, pigeon shooting become a, a illegal, cockfighting become illegal. Um, she uh, was responsible, together with the women she worked with, for the introduction of the first um, uh, humane method for disposing of stray dogs. So. Wow. Uh, prior prior to her, pretty horrible, prior to her stray dogs that were found by police and they couldn't find their owners, they were actually clubbed to death. Like, it's horrific. Oh. Oh. Um, and she was responsible for humane treatment of, of animals and humane disposal in the last resort. Um, profound impact on society. Uh, when she died, politicians and ministers of education and all these things lauded her because she used to go into schools, um, thousands and thousands of schools across New South Wales, teaching kids to be kind to animals. Um, wow. and when she was she died, she was celebrated, and yet she's not 
anywhere in our histories. She's just not recorded. Um, Isn't and that then another terrible? Woman, That's shocking. But, yeah, it's like she's amazing. Um, and hmm. another woman called Constance Duncan who was born in 1896 um, and she was from Victoria. She's a Baptist woman from Victoria who uh, was one of the first women in Victoria to get a motorbike licence. Uh, so during World War I, she would raise money for the Red Cross by giving people rides on her motorbike. <laughs> yeah, she was a legend. I love uh, her. She, she ended up getting involved with um, the Australian student Christian movement uh, and being a travelling secretary for them, which is basically like a travelling teacher and pastor to yeah, university yeah. students. And then she went to Japan and for 10 years she was a missionary in Japan with YWAM. Oh, sorry, not with YWAM, with YWCA. Mm -hmm. And okay. her focus there was on um, the working conditions, particularly of factory girls and women who were often dying um, at their station because they were so overworked and so tired and not enough safety procedures around the machines. Um, and so she instituted that and worked there for 10 years. But when she got home to Australia, it was in the middle of the 1930s. And so she became one of the foremost experts on Asia-Pacific relations in Australia because she was one of the few people that was fluent in Japanese um, and had been on the ground du during the rise of fascism, during the rise of all of these things. And so she um, became an integral part of the League of Nations Union in Australia and later with yep. the United Nations. Um, she ends up being responsible for a lot of our policies in terms of refugees and welcoming international students. Um, just yep. an incredible woman. Um, and one of the things I found out in the course of my research, when I'm like, why is this woman not celebrated? What is going on? Because mm. she's amazing. Mm. Um, yeah. It turns out that she was in a long-term relationship with a woman called Margaret Sutherland, who was one of the most famous composers in Australia at the time. And I so think I've was, heard of her. Yeah, she was a gay woman in a long-term relationship with Margaret Sutherland after Sutherland's marriage broke down because of domestic violence. Yes, yes. Um, and, yeah, so she's not credited with anything. She's very, very few mentions in a couple of political sciences that recognise Wow. the profound impact she had on um, internationalism. But, yeah, just nowhere to be found. You know, that's, uh, that, that is tragic. I mean, I, I think of um, uh, another a famous woman, Dorothea McKellar. Mm -hmm. Now, she, she is famous, of course, for the most famous for that beautiful poem. Yeah. But she actually wrote books with a, a woman called Ruth Bedford, who was a cousin of... My mother's, I don't know if it was a direct cousin or distant or something. But in actual fact, there's a, the latest biography of Dorothy and McKellar reveals that, which we suspected, was that they were lovers. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and the fact they really loved each other and they, they enjoyed each other's company and yeah. so on. I mean, it, it's just awful that that... that was never acknowledged, you yeah. know, and yeah. uh, so our world is changing. Mm. Here's another one for you, Karen, and then we'll mm. move on because I'm amazed, uh, you know, with your research. It must have been extraordinary for you. Let me read to you a little bit of I've only just discovered um, the uh, drag artist in America, Flamey Grant, mm -hmm. who topped the, um, and I'm hoping to interview her later in the year. Oh, that would be awesome. Uh, yeah, but she, she uh, topped the Christian... Uh, music, uh, I can't remember for how long, but was not invited to the presentations. Yeah, that's right. Can what, you imagine it that? Dove Awards or something else? It was something yeah, like, it yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. So she went anyway with some of her friends and yeah. set up set up the front. That's great. So you know that. But the, these lyrics, um, I, I often say um, that we we should judge the health of a society by its extremes. Mm. Um, and I consider um, all cultic religion, all, all high demand cult control stuff mm. as being the extremes. And this is what Flamey wrote about life in the Plymouth Brethren Church. In the church where I was raised, all the women, all the women hid their hair with what can only be called doilies made of lace. Mm. They sat beside their husbands and they never spoke a word because public prayer was not a woman's place 
and uh, the rest of that is fantastic. It's mm. one part with a, a couple, couple of li little bit rude bits in there, but <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very very clever. Yeah. So how did how did your research affect you, Karen? I mean, I, I guess you you must have suspected this sort of stuff, but you must have been you know horrified, yeah. I guess. Well, Were you? In, no, I, I wasn't horrified. I wasn't surprised. That's the problem. Okay. Um, yep. See, I was brought up. You expected uh, it. I, I did. Sadly, I, I, I did not to the extent I thought, um, I'll give you some context. I was brought up in the Salvation Army. And when I was okay. growing up in the Salvation Army, um, women could be anything. Like there was in the 1980s, yes. the international leader of the Salvation Army was Eva Burroughs, who's an unmarried Australian yes. woman. And yep. um, so they could rise to the highest level. Um, and, you know, Catherine Booth, the co-founder of the Salvation Army, is one of my heroes. Yeah. And, and my mum had been an officer before she met my dad and was pastoring churches as a single woman before she met my dad. And then in my late teens, um, I ended up going to Hillsong Church. And Hillsong, again, really celebrates um, women and the Pentecostal church in Australia to an extent. It really celebrates women. But what I started to understand is it celebrates women under certain conditions. And yes, so what I yes. experienced in the Pentecostal church that I hadn't experienced in the Salvos was this um, really quite latent but very, very strong pressure to get married and to have children, that that is what a yeah. Christian woman looks like. Yeah. And um, as I, I ended up, I was a teacher in, and then ended up going overseas, going to Bible college, becoming a pastor, a missionary, all these kind of things. And I would find myself in conversation with these women who were just incredibly, they felt like a failure. They felt like God didn't love them. They felt abandoned mm. and alone in church. And when I dig down to it with them, listening to them and going, why do you feel like a failure? Why do you feel like God doesn't love you? Well, if God mm. loved me, then I'd be married because, you know, that's what a, a good Christian is. The expectation. Is. Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm not that, then I must have done something wrong or displeased God or God doesn't love me or there's something wrong. Um, and so that's when I was like, wait a minute. I, and I started to think about, you know, the pictures of women that were presented and what was celebrated. And, you know, I remember yeah. at, back yeah. at Hillsong when um, particular women who are very, very prominent women who um, had been in ministry and were unmarried women, people like uh, Donna, uh, Donna Crouch, as she is now, um, who's one of the, you know, very influential pastors at, at um, Hillsong. Uh, Christine Kane, who was Christine Cariophilus back then, is unmarried women who when they um, got engaged, like the whole church celebrated, like this is the best thing ever. Like now finally you can serve God with your husband. Now finally, even though they've been doing uh -huh. these incredible things. Um, and it wasn't intentional, but there's, there was a definite layering there. And the same thing, like the pleading with God on behalf of women who were childless and couldn't get pregnant and like asking God to break that curse and to bless them with children. And if you're hearing that as someone who's not married and doesn't have kids, yeah, a message that's coming in, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And so that's, I, that's why I was like, when I said, how did we get here? How do we get to this point yeah. when I know all these stories from when I was growing up, how are we now at a point where this is the image and the expectation of, of women? How did we get there? So. Mm. Mm. Um, so in your journey, um, mm. you know, I know that you've, you've had some difficult times um, and you, you um, and, and they're, they're all to do with um, some of these issues we've just talked about. Yeah. You're now very happily married to a, a gorgeous uh, young lady, yep. <laughs> and I can say that at my age, everybody's young. <laughs> but but you call me young but, as uh, well. Then. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. You're young, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, so Karen, tell us a little bit about that, if you don't mind, if it's not no. too painful. Some of the like you lost your job, you know. Yeah. It's crazy. So, I, um, I guess. What, what started to resonate for me as I was doing my research was this idea that, yep, there were people, there were women in my stories who were unmarried women who were involved in ministry who were doing all mm. these incredible things, and yet there weren't women like me. There weren't women yes. who loved yes. God and loved justice and loved women. <laughs> like, yeah. 
Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and why is that? Um, and that wasn't a, uh, an explicit question that I had initially because I was just trying to understand why do we have this view of women. Essentially, in the process of researching my PhD and in the midst of all of that, um, I quit pastoring at the church where I was, um, partly because of the wrestle that had started in my own life and partly mm, because mm. of a horrendous situation of bullying and abuse that had developed there and the way that I was treated um, and discovered a whole bunch of other people who had been treated that way as well. So that was really oh, painful. Dear. And then uh, on the back of that, I had back in the day been a school chaplain and so I got asked by one of the prominent Bible colleges in Sydney um, when they were starting new programs in chaplaincy and spiritual care, I got asked if I would write some of their subjects. Uh, and I did, and they really liked what I wrote. So they asked if I'd come and be a sessional lecturer uh, and they loved that. So they put me on staff. Um, and I remember agonizing when I looked at that contract, agonizing over, because by that time I knew I was gay and I knew I loved Bronte. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I agonized over signing that contract, but I read it inside and out to make sure that I could sign it with integrity. Yeah. But what happened is this was now the year after the plebiscite. And um, on the back of that, I'd quite just, explain the because, oh, just explain the plebiscite because just explain the plebiscite because some people may not know who who here. Yeah. So the marriage plebiscite happened in Australia in 2017 when the government chose not to, by an act of parliament, update the Marriage Act um, and not to have a referendum, but to um, throw it open to a vote of the Australian people. So it was a compulsory postal vote where um, everyone yeah. in Australia who's on the electoral roll has to vote on whether or not same-sex marriage should be made legal in Australia. Um, and it got across the, the line, amazing. I think the prime, yeah, about 70% for, wasn't it? Uh, 68%, like the, yeah. 68%. <laughs> the, the, the prime minister of the day and his conservative friends, I believe, mm -hmm. expected that it would come back the other way around, but uh, yeah. they were wrong, fortunately. That's, yeah, that's what um, I'm hoping. I mean, so, the Anglican Church in yeah. Sydney donated a million dollars to the no campaign. I know. Um, claiming that, I know. you know, it would be the epitome of evil. And you wonder about the homeless and all the rest of it. But, yeah. Karen, coming back to coming back to your, your story there, sorry to interrupt, but I no, thought that was important. Fine. Context matters. Yeah. A year yeah. after the plebiscite. Yeah, so it's a year after the plebiscite. So, um the a number of different churches and schools a number of different christian organizations um sort of hardened their stance what well, had been kind of you know in the background a bit of an expectation became very explicit because there was a fear mm. that um, schools and churches would lose the right to fire people for being gay which we have that right yep. in new south wales uh, in both our state law and our federal law um, it is legal yep. to fire someone on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender, um, gender identity. And we call that discrimination. Yeah, it's it's protected discrimination. Um, it's yeah. a very weird thing. Anyway, um, and so, but they were afraid that on the back of the marriage plebiscite and same-sex marriage becoming legal at the end of 2017, that, that they would lose that right. And so essentially yep. the legal advice that was going around is that if, um, an institution or organisation had an explicit statement of beliefs within on their website, clearly accessible, um, that said that belief in heterosexual marriage was essential to Christian life and conduct um, and an essential doctrine of Christianity that, you know, as a central belief, they would then continue to get away with that. Um, and so there was a, a rush to kind of make this explicit and that happened as the code of conduct was changed at the place where I worked. Um, and then essentially yes. I, my, the people who I worked with knew, all the people I reported to knew, um, but uh, at the end of 2019 when Bronte and I got engaged, um, word yep. began to kind of filter out into wider evangelical circles. Uh, both myself and the college started getting uh, kind of hate mail and phone calls saying, Karen Pack's a lesbian, that's demonic, you need to publicly denounce her. I was getting letters um, sent to me via my church uh, yeah. saying, um, you know, you, you're evil and you need to repent and you're going to go to hell unless you break up with Bronte and commit to a life of celibacy. Um, I got called demonic going into my church one Sunday morning. Um, it was a pretty horrendous time. Um, but so the yeah. college started getting these letters and concerns that, that I was gay. Uh, and the college principal and board hadn't known 
um, at that highest level, the people I reported to had them. Anyway, so, um, yeah, basically I ended up in a meeting with them where they said, what are you going to do about this? And I said, what do you mean? What am I going to do? Nothing's changed for me. Like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to protect me from the harassment that I'm receiving? Um, and so they went away and thought about that and came back and fired me. Um, and that was in 2020, uh, as the COVID mm -hmm. pandemic was kicking off. Um, and perfect timing. It's perfect time, especially since, as you would know, David, my wife Bronte um, is a physiotherapist at one of the major hospitals mm. here in Sydney. Uh, she happens yeah. to specialize in cardiorespiratory physio, so helping people to breathe and clear their lungs. Um, yeah. So she's like on the front line of the front line of COVID, literally helping people to yeah. live. Like with, um, and we've just signed a contract to buy our apartment, to buy our first house together, uh, and I'm fired. And so it was a pretty, it was a pretty traumatic time. It was pretty rough. Yeah. Oh, and absolutely. And in the midst of that, I'm researching these women going, why have you been erased from the story <laughs> as I am yes. in the midst yes. of being erased from the story? Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's that um, correlation, right? Uh, those, the people, the, there'll be quite a few people who, I mean, this, this podcast doesn't reach an enormous number of people, wish it did, but, um, of uh, lots of people that I that I know and uh, connect with online and so on, mm. um, there are a lot of bruised people yeah. because of an unloving church mm. or unloving, unkind yeah. um, Christian leadership, as you've as that has just described to me. All right, yeah. um, what do you say to people like that? I mean, how how is it that see my as I said earlier my, my um, I don't have an active faith these days, but I still, uh, I still value um, the Gospels, the character of Jesus, which yeah. to me turned upside down um, a culture, hierarchical culture, which was wrong. Yeah. And um, yeah, I won't often wonder how that that character of Jesus would be today in all these situations. Yeah. So. And my, my most uh, recent interview, which you will see shortly, Karen, um, is uh, with uh, the Naked Pastor. Oh, David, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, he's wonderful, isn't he? Absolutely I haven't wonderful. spoken to him, but I know his work. It's fantastic. Oh, look, at it, it's just magic. Yeah. So so what would you say to those people who, who are really hurt by this, mm. you know? But the stuff that you've been through, and yeah. and you look like you 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 know you pulled yourself through, and Bronte's helped you, and so on. Yeah. But yeah, what would you say? Yeah, I, I I was brought up in a context, and particularly in those kind of later years in the Pentecostal church, really, where there was a lot of beauty in what I experienced, um, mm. and I was in an environment that taught both implicitly and explicitly that um, you know you are unconditionally loved by God and church will unconditionally love you and the greatest experience of love and acceptance you will ever find is in church. You know, this is the community of God's people. This is where you'll be loved unconditionally. And I had incredible experiences of love from church. Um, you know, uh, 12 years ago now when I was still pastoring, I was actually run over by a car and it broke my, bed, oh. my, broke my back and smashed my leg and I had to learn to walk oh. again and all that kind of stuff. And in the context of that, my church was amazing. Like they just loved mm. me, um, cleaned my house, cooked me meals for me and my carer for months and months and months, um, made sure that there was wow. always someone with me because I couldn't be left on my own because I couldn't do anything for myself. Um, yeah. Just the love and care was just unbelievable. Um, well, that's that's wonderful. It's it's huge, and and it's there's something incredibly um, gracious and healing about that. And yet, mm. to have the same community completely turn its back on you because you are gay, because you have fallen in yeah. love with someone that is of yeah. the same sex, that yeah. that does something to you. Like it confirms That's... the fear that you've had, you've internalized your whole life where I can be either mm. gay or Christian, but I can't be both. I have to choose between the yeah. two. And it is a choice. And if I don't fight this thing with everything in me, then I will lose everything. I will lose community. I will lose my place in the world. I'll lose my job. And I yeah. did. I lost all of that. But in response to your question, what would I say? I would say this, the, the lie in all of that that I was told 
was that this is the place, the only place you will experience love and acceptance, and this is the definition. But finding community and full acceptance and love on the other side of that, now that is healing. And finding yes, faith communities yes. that allow me to be fully myself. You know, yeah. um, I talk about um, after all that experience um, uh, and the experience of being called demonic at my church and all that kind of stuff, um, for six months after that, at that point, that was actually in 2018, that was before I was fired, that was on the back of the plebiscite as well. Um, for six months after that, I couldn't go to church on a Sunday. I just cried every Sunday. And mm. then one day I said to Bronte, I want to go back to church. I want to go to church this Sunday. Maybe we could go here. Maybe we could go there. And she said, Karen, we're not going to another church. It's not affirming. Like we're not doing that to yeah. ourselves. And so we ended up going to the local little uniting church that's just around the corner. Um, okay. And, you know, on the Facebook page of the church, there's like all these oldies with their walkers, like posing for the picture. Uh, and then the minister had like a rainbow filter on her thing. I'm like, oh, <laughs> rainbow filter, we'll check it out. We'll see what that's about. So we turn up on the Sunday and the minister, Danielle, she's preaching and leading the service and, and her husband and her kids are doing the music and it's all very lovely. And she preaches this sermon that's all about the justice of the gospel, about Jesus loving those on the margins and the unconditional love of God. And Bronte and I sit there crying our way through it because it just feels beautiful. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, at the end of the service, it's very old school. The minister stands at the door and shakes everyone's hand as they're leaving. And so as we get to the door, Bronte just steps in front of me and says, hi, I'm Bronte and this is my partner, Karen. Uh, it's the first time we've been fully out in a church, like to be introduced like wow. that. Um, wow. And she didn't bat an eyelid. And, in fact, six yeah. months down the track, she's saying to me, we're having coffee one day, and she says to me, you and Bronte are such an answer to prayer. And I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And she said, you know, on the back of the plebiscite, in the Uniting Church, each congregation can decide for itself whether it will um, allow same-sex couples to be in leadership, whether it will marry people, same-sex couples in the church. Mm. And I started trying to have that conversation with our congregation. And all these oldies were saying to me, oh, we just don't know any of the gays. If you could just bring some to meet us, then maybe we could, you know, make up their <laughs> mind. But we just don't know. What are they like, these gays? And she said, and then you and Bronte walk in the door. And she said it was an answer to prayer. Um, Isn't that lovely? And it's just like the contrast. You are demonic. You have to fight it every day because who you are is evil. You are an answer mm. to prayer because the congregation gets to see you love one another, and that's beautiful. <laughs> like, mm. Yeah. That, that's that's, that's, that's magic. That's absolutely beautiful. Um, tell me where you're at now. Well, because have you had – with firstly, you know, you go through your studies and then you, you become – Dr. Karen Pack, okay, um, have you had opportunities to present your, your findings? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I actually ended up moving colleges because I was on scholarship at a, yep. at a college, a Christian university, um, and mm -hmm. that um, fired one of their key academics because he was affirming of, of gay theology. Affirming means he believes that you can be gay and Christian. Um, yeah. And so he was fired for having that position. And there was a couple of us on the back of that that ended up leaving that college, myself and Joel Hollier. I'm not sure if there were others. And I ended up um, at Macquarie Uni uh, doing my PhD with Tanya Evans and Marion Maddox, which was absolutely awesome. Um, and I finished that and I'm now lecturing. I did still do some work at Macquarie actually, but I'm lecturing in history at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and I'm also the president of an organisation called Spiritual Care Australia which is the peak body Wonderful. nationally for chaplains and spiritual carers and pastoral care workers. Um, so it's a right. professional association for them. Uh, and I've, they actually got me to do the keynotes at the national conference last year and I presented my research there. Uh, quite a lot of churches, actually, quite a number of churches have asked me to come and speak. Um, I spoke at a conference in January called Future Church uh, and I've just wow. um, – uh, accepted a deal with Rutledge to um, do a book based on my PhD research. So that will be coming out Fantastic. probably next year. Yeah. Oh, look, that's wonderful. Well, um, I'd love to talk to you again when the book comes out. Yeah, sure. And and folk give you a, a chance to share more about yep. the book. So that that's wonderful. And 
How does the f- future look like for you and Bronte? Yeah, it looks pretty good, actually. Um, <laughs> it's amazing how, how life can feel when um, you're no longer afraid that if people got a glimpse of this part of yourself that you're desperately terrified of bringing into the light, um, when you're no longer afraid what will happen to you if people see that, it's amazing how free you can live. Um, and how much more fully you can love other people. Like it's one of my fundamental values because of who Jesus is and because of the way that I read the Bible, um, that I see God as a refuge. Like there's this psalm in the Bible, Psalm 46, that says God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Um, And I see Jesus as this person who created safety and refuge for people at the very margins of society who'd been abused and oppressed and exploited by people, the kind of people that everyone else would walk past and Jesus would stop and look them in the eye for a conversation and create an environment of safety and refuge. And I'm like, I want to be that person. Um, But you can actually only create safety for others when you know safety yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I have this relationship with Bronte where I can be fully myself, where my family and her family knows us fully as ourselves, Um, And there's no part of us that's hidden now from other people. Like there's an incredible freedom in that. And there's a depth in relationship that, um, that is pretty beautiful. So the future looks pretty good. I'd love to, like, I love lecturing. I love lecturing in history. I want to do more of that. Um, But I really love being on the margins or the intersection between kind of society and the church and speaking into both of those, speaking into academia and speaking into the church because there's conversations that need to happen that haven't been allowed to happen. Um, mm-hmm. And I just mm-hmm. I want to do more of that, of just sharing um, the breadth and depth um, and beauty of the story that is the church that, you know, so often we've highlighted some of the awful parts and we need to actually be more honest about hi- highlighting the really awful parts. Um, like yeah, how oh, many, oh, absolutely. You know, how many gay and queer and trans yeah. people commit suicide because of the way they're treated by the church. Yeah. Um, but we also, I think, need to not just highlight that, but also highlight the incredible gay and queer and trans people uh, that have been a part of the church from the very beginning, just loving God yeah. and loving people and tell their stories so that, you know, the little Karens and little Brontes of the future can actually see themselves in the story and know that they're allowed to exist. That's healing. Uh, that, that's 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 just tr- tremendous. Um you, you'd be aware that the small charity that uh, that I'm involved in, Humanity in Need, Rainbow Refugees, yeah. supporting queer refugees in East Africa. Yeah. And the many of these people, um, you know, their lives are totally miserable, yeah. but largely to do with um, conservative evangelical preaching yeah. and evangelical fundraising. Yeah, that's right. Where that they have actually... On... Absolutely. And so you end up with all these uh, people who you know, in Uganda, uh, the work that I do, yep. you as well, you know, you could be locked up for yep. 15 oh, years yeah. or longer, yep. Yep. Um, beaten up, abused, whatever, yep. um, and so on. So we need to turn it around. And, uh, yeah. and, I'm, and, and you're one of the turnarounders, uh, turnarounders, <laughs> aren't you? I certainly <laughs> hope to be because the reality of that situation Um, in East Africa and West Africa as well uh, and in the Middle East and in parts of Asia is that so much of those deeply, deeply conservative homophobic churches, it's actually a legacy of colonialism, not of Indigenous culture. Um, And it's, you know, the British pull out, the French pull out, whoever, and those societies move forward and become more and more inclusive and more and more embracing. But they've left this colonial imperialist theology that is stuck at a moment of time that says fidelity to jesus looks like hatred of that yes. them yes and that yes. we need to be honest and confront that and confront the legacy um of of colonialism and imperialism in that sense as well as in all the other atrocious senses that we've left it you hear um you hear the messages from the conservative politicians and mm. and clergy and so on in East Africa, in West Africa, and so on, in Russia, yeah. and, and other places, um, and they are taught. They blame the West 
for uh, you know the, the 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 progressive attitudes to LGBTIQ and so on. Yeah. Whereas you're quite right, before colonialism, yeah. um, you know, each of those cultures were yeah. much more accommodating That's and right. much more welcoming of yeah. people of difference than exactly the West right. has has been to date yeah. yeah so look it's it's wonderful talking to you the, la the last one i'm going to ask you is do you are you familiar with the work of kittredge cherry no i know that name why do i know that name david okay i'll send you a link to that she also is um, uh, uh, a, a queer lady who has been researching for years the lgbtq saints and the queer saints of history <sighs> and puts out a name. newsletter about them and Mm. Yeah, there's so many people, and again, so these are these are people who've been buried in history. Yeah, uh, because that's right. the fellows didn't want people to know about them. <laughs> yep. Or they weren't buried at the time, but we've had to bury them retrospectively. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Mm. Karen, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you so much for your time today, oh, it's and a uh, I'm sure that. Look, lots of people are going to love hearing the, what you've been doing, your work, and look forward to what you do in the future. And uh... Some people around the world are giving money to spread messages of hate and to see LGBTIQ people marginalised, victimised, imprisoned and murdered. It's time for others to stand up and say enough is enough. Please support the work of this podcast, No Sex Please, I'm Religious and visit our website www.nosexplease.com.au to make a donation today.